All right, everybody, welcome to episode two of Training Without Conflict podcast. Today we have Mark Plonsky as my guest. He is a retired professor emeritus of experimental biopsychology, University of Wisconsin. And also he had in the early 90s, the very famous website, a dog training website called Dr. Peace. Um, right now he also has his own canine consulting business. Without any further delay, Mark, welcome to the show. The way I got to know Mark, I think we met, man, it's been such a long time. It's so cool to talk to you. Like, yeah, like your seminars. I know, I feel like some, some, some seminar, that's what it was. And, and then eventually uh, you, you did few write-ups for my training without conflict videos. And from there on we hit it, I mean, I, I, I cannot imagine how many nights we, I, I would call you because my mind's just exploding with science stuff. And I'm like, Mark, please, can you explain this to me? Cause, but there've been times that even you, I remember you're like, I, I need, I need time on this. <laughs> and then you call me back and then we talk forever again. I, I would say my to go person, any, anything that. I need help with, with scientific stuff. Way back when the internet started, maybe a little bit after, there was the, the one of the most popular websites at the time, dog websites, Dr. P, Dr. P's. Uh, Makes you uh, feel old now. Now what you do, you do the, you have that canine one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, the consulting. Well, what I did was I converted that old site to just a, library of articles that I've written personally. Mm -hmm. So this way it's nothing to keep up where if somebody changes where they keep the material, I don't got to track it down. I put the material on the server. It's still housed on the university server because I'm not um, doing any advertising or any trying to make any money on it. And then in addition to that, I have my own web server where I have a business, a canine consulting service that I help people with the um, uh, problems, competition, whatever they've got going on with their dogs. Sometimes I uh, work with lawyers doing the um, expert witness stuff. Mm -hmm. Things to do, but I, I want to get into all the articles because there's some awesome articles that you've written over the years for sure. It, it almost seems like sometimes we, you and I will have this deep conversations for a few hours late night and then and then it gets you going and then you, you write these beautiful articles that I'm going to post like after the podcast, we're going to have all the links for this is very, very interesting. Oh, but, uh, one of the articles I wrote, because the, la the last couple I posted, I posted in close in time. And that was the time where you were, you were especially interested in the article that I wrote on uh, the purely positive approach. Um, but I also wrote an article at that time on classical conditioning and how that relates to dog training. And I think that's an area where, you know, dog trainers have spent an enormous amount of time at this point on operant conditioning, reinforcement contingencies, ad nauseum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not criticizing that. That's a great thing. I think uh, for many trainers, an understanding of operant conditioning has helped enormously. But let, I think that as a researcher, one of the things that I particularly studied in studying animal learning, how people and animals learn, you know, I ran rats through mazes for like 25 years. That's a lot of rats going through their mazes. But one of the things I particularly studied was the mechanisms and theories to help us understand classical conditioning. That guy Pavlov with the drooling dogs and all that stuff. For, for some reason, it's still like there was this huge boom in the early 90s about the operant conditioning and the shaping and and somehow it's still. That's why I see it as being um, so contagious, so successful in getting spread through the dog training community. Where classical conditioning is kind of more subtle. It's more of an undertone. 
Uh, but nonetheless, I see it as the two go hand in hand. Um, in fact, some folks would argue, although this is probably getting off field, that classical and opera conditioning, they're really one thing. They're not even different. It's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. Yeah, because eventually they start to overlap, but I would be interested to hear a little bit, and I'm sure the the audience will be interested to, to, to hear a little bit about that if you want to go a little bit on that. Well, the way, the way I wrote this article, and it's posted on the web, I tried to orient it towards your average person could read it rather than a college student or professor. And uh, I talked about how with classical conditioning, three things are learned. Um, you know, in operant conditioning, the animal learns, what do I need to do to get something good or avoid something bad? Or on the other hand, if you want to get more complex, what do I need not to do to get something good or avoid something bad? Which is the less talked part of it. But with classical conditioning, classical conditioning is concerned primarily, first and foremost, with what predicts what. Yeah, it's all anticipation of I know what comes next. You know now I have my school for dog trainers. And I do cover, I mean, we talk about opera and, and classical and I teach both very extensively. Ultimately, I really try to explain much more the classical part because when we train dogs, we're, we are giving the dogs commands. And even if you start with shaping, even if you, which, whichever way you're gonna start, eventually you're telling the dog what to do. You're cueing the dog what to do, which becomes classical event no matter what. And if you don't understand how classical conditioning works and what are the components and what are the big mistakes that you, you just really completely ruin it because it's about prediction, right? So as long as the dog can predict somewhere else what comes next instead of what you want him to predict it from, you just blew your training session and, and much more than that, right? I think the important thing with classical conditioning, the, the first important thing is what predicts what. But the second thing, which um, operant conditioning ignores emotions. Operant conditioning doesn't even want you to talk about emotions, but classical conditioning is first and foremost, that's because an event is important to learn about if it's emotional. And so, we got to be careful with the emotions because if we do something and it makes that animal think that something really bad is going to happen, the animal is not going to like this. Yeah, it's not going to be a pleasant emotion. I mean, emotions dictate level of motivation and what kind of motivation depending on what kind of emotion is involved. So we were talking about those emotions and um, if the particular, you know, like Pavlov talked about a, a tone predicting food. So when a tone tells the dog that food's going to happen, that yes, something is going to happen, and it's a pleasant thing, one could argue that the dog was feeling joy. It was happy to, that it was being told you're going to get food. Now, if I'm telling you that something bad's going to happen, you're not feeling so good. You're feeling distress. If I'm telling you that something good that you were expecting to happen is not going to happen, you're probably feeling disappointment. And I want to make clear that I'm arguing that people and the dog both have these emotions. We both show classical conditioning. Last but not least, to round out the quadrant, if I'm telling you that something bad is not going to happen, you're like, whew, you're feeling relief. So I think it's important that dog trainers kind of get the hang of that some of the cues, you know, that if what they do and then they, let's say, shock an animal, that if that cue predicts shock, the animal's not feeling good about that. And I'm not saying the animal should always feel good, but what I am saying is that the trainer should have a, a bit of a handle on what they're doing and what kind of emotions it's going to create in that dog. I, I'm so so much with you on this because uh, in in a big part I think it's to blame the the whole operant like the shaping of 
with by approximation kind of style of training because it's just focuses so much strictly on creating a behavior that the trainers forget about that there is actual living being with emotions in front of them and they're just chasing that behavior after behavior after behavior not understanding that if you tap in the right emotions that dog's gonna want to do it so much better and so much more uh, um, with, with the, the joy as, as you're saying it in there. I, I never got to talk about this one thing that I'm kind of leading up to. The, remember I said the animal learns three things in classical conditioning. One of them is what predicts what. And then I showed you how, or we just discussed how emotions are learned because emotions are involved when we're talking about biologically relevant stimuli. But the third thing is, is really interesting, and that's that the animal comes to treat the predicting stimulus as if it was the biologically relevant stimulus. So with Pavlov, he rang a tone and he followed it with food. Eventually the animal salivated to the food. You know, so what has this got to do with dog training? How could I, as a dog trainer, use the fact that the animal begins to treat the predicting stimulus as if it was the biologically relevant stimulus. And what comes to mind is a um, particular psychologist, uh, let's see if I get her name here, uh, Dr. Pamela Reed. Uh, she's up in Canada, I believe. And I was attending one of her conferences, one of her um, seminars many years ago. And somebody in the audience asked how uh, they, they wanted to get the dog to do retrieves but they didn't want to use force at all. And the dog had no inclination to do the retrieve. And so Dr. Reed replied that basically you could use this fact that in classical conditioning, the animal begins to treat the stimulus as if it was the biologically relevant stimulus. So let's make a long story short here. How are we going to get this animal to retrieve using classical conditioning? The person wanted the dog to retrieve a dumbbell for competition. And so what Allison Reed said was that if the dumbbell predicts food, then the animal would begin to treat the dumbbell as if it was food. It would try to eat it. If it tries to eat the dumbbell, that's the beginning of a retrieve. And then we could begin to use operant conditioning to reward those behaviors. So what she did then was to tell the person to put the dog in a crate and to cut a little hole in the crate so that a dumbbell could be lowered into the crate using a pulley system. Mm. And so then what happens is you lower the dumbbell into the crate and then give the dog a food pellet. You do this a bunch of times. Eventually, the dog goes and bites the dumbbell, at which point you say, good dog, and reward that behavior. So this is an example of how you could use uh, classical conditioning to help uh, teach a, a, a dumbbell retrieve. Yeah, that would have been cool to have a video of that, no? Well, that, and I, I would love to have had a video of that, and I don't, but I do have a video that will help illustrate this concept and that was done by a, another read but not not uh, not Pamela Reed this was done by a professor like myself Dr. Alliston Reed and he was teaching his had his students like I've often done train rats to press a bar but what he did was train the rats to play basketball the objective here in rat basketball is to gain a better understanding of how to shape the rats or shape your subjects into during a certain behavior. Once they get um, the ball into the basket, they'll get a reward in here, and that will be their reward to reinforce the score. So notice the rat drops it into the basket and gets a pellet. But notice how much difficulty the rat has in letting go of the basketball. If the rat is treating that basketball as if it's food, it can't let it go, it can't stop wanting to chew it, 
because that basketball comes to predict that food and so it's treated as if it was the food. And so classical conditioning explains why these rats are having a really difficult time I love it. letting go of those basketballs. I love it. That's your, actually the, um, what was their names? Kelly and, and Miriam Bertland, right? The, the instinctual drift. They did it, they did that with the raccoon. That's one of the biggest, well, I wouldn't say the biggest, but one of the, the main components of the time discoveries where operant conditioning and specifically Skinnerian form of reinforcement started to kind of get shaken. Because up to that point, everybody thought that, oh, we just reinforce and there is no way we, we're going to make it happen. And without considering that genetic predisposition, what just happened there, it, it, that, that was a, that was a wake up call. And, and actually in, in, you know, I mean, then, then you have the few, few more kind of really big cool studies that happen after and before that pointed out that reinforcement, it's not one for everything. And it just, as long as we reinforce and we suppress things will happen or not happen. That was the, the original theory, if, if I'm not wrong. And I remember, I, I, uh, I actually teach this in my class uh, about uh, John Garcia. He tried to publish, that was in the 60s, he tried to publish this and they were not letting him publish it for years because it, it just will crumble the whole system of reinforcement. Mind-blowing. And what, what really happens even today, people still believe that, um, um, you know, you can be all you can be as long as you do the right things and you get reinforced and you get like completely disregarding your genetic makeup. Especially like for, for dog trainers, so important to, to recognize and appreciate genetics. For, for anybody that spends enough time over the research that's been done, that claims that positive reinforcement is the solution for everything and it's just better than anything, which is the old Skinnerian concept. I think it's created a lot of problems. I mean, a good example is these days, the dog pulls. People put a harness on the dog a harness to stop pulling. I don't know what planet they're living on, but I put a harness on the dog when I want it to pull. So yeah. putting a harness on the dog to stop pulling doesn't work. I mean, it keeps me in business. It enables my canine consulting service to flourish, but I don't think it's helping people. And my impression is they do that because it's viewed as positive and gentle and force free. I'd be all for it if it worked. The problem is it don't work. The thing is, like, I tell you what, like from, from a competitive, and you know, I'm like super competitive in dog sports. Like I, if I know that something works better than anything else, I, I would travel, if I need to go to Mars, I, I find a way to go to Mars to learn that skill. And that's not just me, that's, that's probably, 80% of the, all the die-hard dog trainers that go and compete, we are always in a search, always in a quest to perfection and to find a better way. Everybody would love to have a dog that you don't need to use any aversives and be the best. When you go into all the studies that swear by positive reinforcement, you would see it's a very interesting phenomenon because like in, let's say 10 years ago, a study, a paper comes out and they claim something, but they clearly say, well, it works or maybe doesn't, but more research is needed. And next thing you know, the next study that comes up cites that as a fact, as a reality. And Fast forward 10 studies ahead. Now they are all have cited each other for the bullshit that the first one came up with. 
And for the average person that reads a study and sees all those, okay, well, oh, it's got to be true because, I mean, look how many, you know, it's confirmed 10 times in, in various studies in the past. But if you take the time and you go back and you see they are all, there is no base and they cannot be replicated just as we were talking with John. It is frustrating because we, as dog trainers, we want to move forward. We want to find the best ways to train, the most effective and the most humane ways. But when such false information is thrown at us, it confuses things. And fortunately, there is always, you know, you can, you can make a survey with 10 dogs. You can make a little, you know, paper and, and do some research that you got funded by, you know, it's guaranteed that it's going to work just because you're using the right words and, and the, the idea fits the politically correct trend right now. So, yes, you're going to get published. But everybody, I bet you, they also know that it doesn't work that way. Because if you spend enough time in science, you, you must be... I, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I'll, I'll listen to you because. Well, I would say it's not just for dog trainers. I see this emphasis on purely positive to be part of the problem where my students towards the later part of my career, in my opinion, were typically not as good as the students in my earlier part of my career. Because student people these days, parents don't want to say no to their kids, just like trainers don't want to tell their dog no, I think it's a problem not just for dogs, but for society. Sometimes people and dogs need to be punished. I mean, I'm not saying it should be brutal. It should certainly be humane and appropriate principles that science has shown. For example, it needs to be prompt. It needs to be consistent. I mean, there, there are, we've studied this enough to know what works and what doesn't. Yes. But what See, this is ethics. This is this is exactly my point. Like you, like this is what they have created. You you feel almost guilty when you say punished. You feel that you have to actually back up and and explain that it's not what you imagine because it's ingrained by now in everybody that this must be something horrific. And punishment is. It's so valuable and it can happen and it happens in every day. It's just, it's like the wind and the rain. I mean, you know, you turn the hot knob. Both you and I particularly like the use of negative punishment, which doesn't involve aversive events. We're taking right. away something good and the animal learns from that. But that needs a lot of explanation. Most people don't understand that right away. A lot of times the argument of the force free is that we know all the how they would bring all the side effects the bad side effects the punishment but just as you're talking with your students i'm sure you know they grew up like this at home at school at the university they were always led to believe that you can be all you can be and you're the champion and you're the champion and 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 next thing you know, they enter real life. And now they have a job and, and they're not the champion. And that must hit them very hard. Yes, indeed. I mean, it used to be early on in my teaching career, the first 10, 20 years, when I gave a student a poor grade, they went home and studied harder and realized that they messed up. In the later part of my career, when I gave a student a poor grade, they blamed me that I didn't do my job or whatever. And that's the point with, you know, how one of the favorite top three things to point out about side effects of punishment is that it, it creates the counterattack, it creates aggression. But so does positive reinforcement. Once you learn to be, oh, you're the champion, you're the best, and you're whatever, and all of a sudden you come to realizations that you are just 
an ordinary person and you have to accept it and you have to function through life and get a real job and actually prove that you are who you are. And you have two choices. You're gonna get angry or you're gonna start getting depressed. And neither one is good because all that positive upbringing didn't help you function in reality. But I would argue that aversive events are more prone to like when I, when I uh, bump my knee or stub my toe, I get angry. Um, yeah, I might get angry if I don't get something that I was I was promised that was good, but the aversive events have a tendency to create a little more nasty aggression a little more quickly. Yeah, the, the, this would be, uh, I think you would agree with this, um, non-contingent versus contingent, right? Mm -hmm. It always has a very, very big role. And this is actually, in fact, part of what really pisses me off about the studies that come up, because they will always bring some really beautiful, easy, cool example of how positive reinforcement will do magic, and then bring the ugliest non-contingent punishment event that is just horrific thing that like, why would you do it? Who, who does it anyway? And if somebody does it, they should not. I mean, clearly should not, but... Yes. But how can you use that as your example of, of comparison? That's just such a bad manipulation. Like in the article I wrote, uh, talking about purely positive, I talked about how even today in 2020, punishment is still used with humans in severe situations like children that are self-injuring and babies that, uh, let's see, in that article, I talked about a baby that uh, if they didn't use punishment, the baby would have died. It was vomiting to the point where it was emaciated. It wasn't going to survive. And they arranged contingent punishment for the stomach contractions. They hooked it up to a, a EK, uh, um, something to measure the muscle contractions. And as soon as the muscle contract, they gave a shock. And that was the thing that turned it around. The kid began eating and not the kid went on to survive. But this is a case where humans in a medical setting use aversive stimuli, electric shock or other such punishment but you don't hear about that a lot. No, no, you don't like, like for sure, like it, it, I, I can argue with anybody that I can list more positive side effects of proper punishment than the negative. Like if you, if we put the cost and benefits of, of correct use, the, I, I don't see how somebody can argue. Well, but you, you, the, you said a key word, the proper punishment, proper use. Like for example, both you and I, when we use punishment, we always make an alternative behavior available that can be reinforced. That's a given, but many people don't. And I would call that inappropriate use of punishment. That's gonna lead to more unpleasant side effects and less positive results than when an alternative appropriate behavior is made available that can be rewarded. No, I mean, there, there is so, so many rules or, or laws of, of how, how to and why to, to, how to, how to apply punishment, you know, I mean, but this is the problem because I, I, I think at this point where we are in the dog training world, you know, we know, we know in Europe, it's all, I mean, I would say at this point, the majority of the countries, the, the electric colors are banned and, and certain, a, a lot of things are banned in, in the quest to, to stop using aversives altogether. But what happens in reality, I, I think it's far more dangerous because you don't need to be scientific you know, uh, a person that just digs into science, you, you're you born to understand that, you know, you approach something that attracts you and you avoid something that 
it's aversive. This is biological, you know, probably the most fundamental rule in our universe. And subconsciously, we understand that. We don't need to really study it. It's like, no, you, you touch the hot stove and you back off and you're like, okay, that was dumb. But what happens when we have these studies and we decide propaganda that bans everything, I'm so against the banning, but once you start banning things that work, people continue to use them, but they hide. And when they hide, they don't get the right education. And they rush things, and they do dumb things. And actually, I am, I, I witness it, because I go places and I train dogs and I see people. You know, when, when you are doing things behind doors and there is nobody to teach you and nobody to, to actually show you how to do things, right? You're literally just doing stupid shit because you have to hide and you know like i mean with everything i'm sure you i don't know how you feel but i i'm like don't you don't ban things educate show show, show if if you claim that something is better it's very easy to show that it is and if it is guess what we all gonna line up like like we're gonna pay you money Forget about your scientific paper. You're gonna be rich because we all gonna come at your door. Please give us a workshop and please teach us. No question, right? I think that's one of the biggest problems of the value judgment and ethics getting in the way of, of the appropriate use of punishment is that people are afraid to talk about it or they don't want to talk about it because they think they shouldn't use it because it's bad. But when what bugs me, though, is when they say that science shows it doesn't work or that that it, it works not as good or no, science doesn't. It show. never says that it's like the ridiculous cherry picking of three sentences and you make one that you want it to be. I don't know. Where do you, where do you think we're going? I mean, where where is this going to go? Like I. I am hoping that eventually the world's gonna people will be like, okay, let let's let's back up and let's start over and let's rethink this and let's do it right. Humanity is just uh, uh, flowed, you know, like we this this will never happen, most likely. I don't think that'll happen. What you're describing, no, I don't think it'll happen. But I am somewhat optimistic that i mean people are going to continue to train dogs in ways it, it may not like the use of e-collars or whatever they're, they're going to continue to get used i mean the government the the um the military they need their dogs and so the dogs are still going to get trained um yes but your average joe will have access to those kinds of tools or even the knowledge to use them that may take quite a bit longer quite a few countries in Europe, police and military, they also are not allowed to, to use aversives. Yeah, by, by law. I mean, they have to. We, everybody knows that you have to. So you, you're, you know, in some ways, you're becoming a little bit of a criminal because you're doing something against the law in order to do your job. I don't know. I think that the military kind of does least here in the United States, I, I don't think they're telling us the things they really do. You know what, like, um, there's some interesting things in Europe, I tell you. I mean, there is a whole market, for example, right now, that you can, you buy all sorts of collars and things that you basically can hide the training equipment so nobody knows. That's even here in the United States. Prong collars, all kinds of covers and right. files that are less visible. And and when you look at the, the very first studies that they started, you know, the, the one was in that Dutch study. I think it was 2003. And even in that study, they just went so overboard. The dogs are afraid to walk in the park, afraid of their shadows and, and all sorts of just, just like... A, crazy ideas but the interesting part is that they suggest 
that they should breed dogs <laughs> with less drive, dogs that are uh, easier to manage. Because obviously you don't have a solution, so therefore let's change the makeup of the dog. And the other one in that same study, which is the, the very first study that, that um, started that whole movement of banning training equipment, even there they admitted that especially like for predatory uh, behavior problems, you know, like ships and chasing wild stock and car chasing, use of aversive to suppress is essential. Even, even they said it in their study. But that part is never said in the studies that came after. Mm -hmm. and very interesting how, again, it's the cherry picking. After that, there was the second big study that kind of basically really topped off everything. And it was like, okay, now we ban everything. And I think that was um, Schalke, it was Germany, Hanover, and I think it's 206 or something, I don't know. So in this particular one, they carefully right away tell you that those are beagles, beagle dogs that are bred for study. They are like laboratory dogs. So they're not like, you know, this one lived in that home and this one lived in that home. They're all genetically similar and they are brought up in the same environment. So, it's, you know, that, that makes sense, right? So what they did, they taught everybody how to chase that prey. And then it's like, okay, now we're gonna use electric shock to stop them. And there is group A, group B, and group C. And I don't know which of the groups, but let's say group A, what they did, they actually taught a recall and punished the dog if the dog didn't come and to, to leave the toy. On the group B, there was no recall, they were just punish the dog for to stop chasing. And group C, guess what they did? They basically shocked the dogs randomly. Like, like pretty much flipping a coin, pop. Flipping a coin, pop. Like, completely non-contingent, right? The thinking behind this was that some people just don't know better and they will just do crazy shit, which it's very true. I know people that will do crazy stuff, that they're just not intelligent enough and, or they don't care for the animal. I know there are people like that. But so far the, the whole study looked pretty cool until that point that they used that group dog C where basically they were non-contingently shocked as the reason why we should not use collars to where the, the group A and group B, they actually prove to function and prove that even though they had stress in during the learning, they recovered and they were completely sound and perfectly fine to where group C poor things, they were afraid to walk into the room and rightfully yeah. so. But if you don't take the time and actually study and see how it goes, and if you're the, just the emotional, I love dog people, and you say, well, no, see, this is what happens. They don't want to even go into that room anymore. They are a nerve wreck and they truly are. I'm surprised. Like when was that study done in the 2006, you said? Roughly? Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised they could even do that study now because these days doing studies involving aversive events takes approval of committees and such. Used to be easy to get approval. Nowadays, very difficult to get approval. So even to study that kind of thing has become harder to do. Yeah, in Europe, for some reason, I think it's just because of the the good cause, so to speak. They continue to do so. I mean, right now, um, um, 
right now in the UK, it's a big war. Same goes in Holland also right now. But in the UK, it's, a, it's been for several years right now a big battle. You know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I talk like this and I wish someday I can actually talk to these people because I would love to have a conversation with them because I listen to, I listen. Researchers. Yes, yes. Like, like for example, there's a, like in the UK, there is a, Dr. Mills, there's, there's a, there's, there are few people. Uh -huh. I've, I've had dinner one time with Dan Mills at a conference and stuff. Nice guy. Um, he's a researcher though. That, Dan is not a dog trainer, Dr. Mills. Yeah, but as, as we were talking earlier, I think everybody wants to have a piece of the pie related to dogs. Quick yeah, question. I mean, Coming back to that study, group A, B, and C, I'm predicting group A did the best, huh? Yeah, I mean, they, they actually both did good, but group A did the best, yes. What was interesting about that study, what really was interesting is because, of course, you're measuring stress, you're doing all the cortisol levels and all this stuff, which, which I kind of want to talk to you about the cortisol level stuff because I really, personally, from everything that I know, I don't believe that that's a good way to say that you're stressed to the point that this is something that you should not do because I think cortisol level can, um, but, but, but let, let, we, 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 we'll talk about this in a second, but, uh, the group A did the best. The other one, group B also was fine. And, and the, the cool thing is they, just like anything, you, you stress out when you're learning something, especially when you want to learn. Like if I, I always give these examples of, of if, you, if you're a student and you sincerely want to do the best you can tomorrow at your test, you're going to be sick that night. You're going to be studying. You're not going to want to eat. You're going to be stressed as, as you can imagine. And there is really nothing that's coming from outside. It's your own motivation to be the best you can that puts the stress on you. When we always measure stress, and especially when we measure stress during the processes, not after, which is the, the, the more important part, you know? Because if we're thinking any electrician that goes to work, let's take the, the ones that climb this crazy heights with this insane uh, uh, level of, of electricity. They don't go, today is the day that I'm gonna die on that pole to work. They go to work, they know that they're making good money and they know that if they stay consciously aware, there is nothing to worry about. That's, that's uh, you know, as long as you understand, I mean, I mean, it comes back to contingent versus non-contingent. It's a, it's a big deal. Sure, if I, if I walk in, in my training room and I touch something and I get zapped, I touch it again, but I didn't, then I touch something else and I get zapped, I'm, I will walk out. I'll be like, what, I don't know what's going on. You might not walk out if you were receiving uh, pockets of a hundred thousand dollars here, a hundred thousand dollars there. The zaps might not be so bad. That's true too. <laughs> we actually, when we train sometimes, and even even during the the class when I have the courses and stuff, we we would have few drinks. We will be talking dogs, and we will actually do something like this, to where we will put some electric color and there is a certain amount of dollars on the other end of the room and and some people make it some people don't and you know but but you want to play and you want to play or you don't want to play and how motivated are you for that goodie it brings a super good point uh, i mean we do it as a game but but there is a lot to take away from from that silly drunken game Victoria Stillwell, she has, you know, she has her academy, she has this thing and 
it's so easy when when things are presented in a certain way to you like do you want to be the bad person or do you want to be the good person do you love dogs or do you want to punish them that's how things get presented and and what do people do of course i mean who who is this you know and as i was talking to you earlier you know the of course there is not cases out there but those people it doesn't matter what you're gonna ban and what you're gonna take away they're just bad people they don't need anything to be bad people there's always the heavy hand that's kind of hard to ban that right so what what victoria was doing <clears throat> in one of her because she has a school for trainers so she brings this electric collar and of course they call it shock collar and it's like oh i'm gonna use it on level one on me on my arm okay i feel it it's a little tinkle it's okay now i'm gonna use it on level two. Oh, that hurts a little bit too much now i'm gonna use it on level three and i'm like okay victoria why i mean obviously if level two hurt you enough like what is the point like why would you go to level three to prove that it hurts of course it hurts it's meant to hurt but that the interesting part about electric colors is that it really and i'm not saying that things cannot go wrong because there is plenty of things that go wrong but again when done correctly when you use electric color what happens is the brain gets triggered and it hits that panic button that says this is an emergency we may die but we know very well that this is not an emergency and you're not going to die it just activates that part of your brain that's the beauty of it but otherwise it's completely harmless and you use that in your advantage it's the reason why in in s all the laboratory studies they don't use two by fours or air puffs or things like that because animals get injured every day i mean you know that you you've done that all the time to where the using electricity tells the brain the right hey watch out this is something you don't mess with the controlled measure the versus stimulus and compared to a two by four which is not so controlled or measured yes One and argue as steve lindsay does in his books that the e-collar is a uh, unemotional way to administer it that by removing yourself from i mean that he's basically what i'm getting at is he's arguing the electronic collar being remote has some advantages as a way of punishing an animal as compared to uh, doing it physically yeah yeah and uh, but you know like this is like um uh, the reason i brought victoria in the conversation is that she says oh this hurts really bad now let's go higher i'm like why if if this is enough for you not to do something we are Clearly, good it wasn't enough for her not to do things right i would argue right when i and i use a level that works real good and no the animal doesn't want any more the person doesn't want any more i'll tell you a really funny story really really cool one i was giving a seminar in i think it was romania it wasn't bulgaria it was, it was one of these european countries and i was trying to explain how negative reinforcement would work and of course it was easier to explain it with an electric collar i asked for a volunteer and a woman like she just rushed to be the volunteer like like i'm talking just jumping through the desk to come to the to the front I'm like okay so i put the collar on her and i put her hand on the wall i tell her move your hand and then i tap her on a very low level like really low level i say move your hand and i then tap her and as i tap her she's holding her hand but she is now overreacting she's like ah 
I'm like, okay, that's a little weird. Kind of catch me, surprised me, you know? Because it doesn't move her hand, but it's like, ah, and like, I'm like, okay, let's do this again. Move your hand, little Nick. Ah. I think she'd probably do that even if you didn't do anything. So she had the point to prove that electric is very bad and punishment and any not punishment but just the use of aversive is very bad she clearly came from that camp to the workshop to prove that point yes so i stopped and i have a conversation i'm like what what are you trying to prove do you understand what i'm trying to do she's like no doesn't matter what you're trying to do you're using electric yes she's like no i don't understand and i'm very upset She's trying to, to do all the things that science says that happens, and she wants to prove me wrong. So guess what I do? I don't tickle anymore. I actually go on a level that I know that she's going to respond instead of acting out that she actually will feel it. So I say, move your hand. And she's like, ah, and I go, bam, and she goes, boom, and moves her hand. I bet she did. I'm like, let's do this again. Now she's looking at me and she, like you can see how all of a sudden it's not going her way. But now she's in front of everybody. I'm like, put your hand. So she puts her hand. I put the, call, I put the remote control on the table. She doesn't know, everybody sees it. I'm like, move your hand, boom. I'm like, thank you, have a seat jump of course she did it's it's nature now on, on the other side you know like we can talk about this because that's interesting always to me because the the force free community always bring this comparison of okay this is the reward based trainer and this is the punishment how did they call it now not punishment based but correction based punishment I think it's punishment based or something, something really dumb. Like, like you cannot possibly have punishment as foundation of your training. You just cannot. Well, you or I might not, but hey, people are creative. I, I mean, how? I, I always would wonder how, how can you actually do everything only by punishment? It would be the same way that the purely positive folks are doing are completely ignoring punishment so the theoretical purely i'm not sure i, I, I have trouble calling it purely negative i think you understand but why. it's not just even negative it's it's not that it, they're not even saying that you're yeah you're not saying that you're using aversive or you're using negative reinforcement and positive punishment they're saying it's punishment based training which means you're only punishing actions you're you're not asking for anything to happen you're only stopping correct theoretically you could be punishing inaction lack of action like you told her to move her hand mm -hmm. if she didn't move her hand she she moved her hand ultimately you made the action happen i can see that man that would be that would still be very um years ago we talked about a variety of operant conditioning paradigms including active avoidance passive avoidance yeah but but man i don't see this to always punish and to believe that actually the dog's gonna choose to do the things that you want them to do because that's what they suggest when they say punishment based like like they they truly want you to believe that they do nothing but punishing i i don't think i mean I, I i've thought about it can i do it myself and i know i cannot i don't think uh, you know like we're not talking i'm not talking a simple one or two behavior we're talking a, a performance of 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 anything you know and you just have punishing punishment as your only option i see it as a continuum 
Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the purely positive folks don't even acknowledge that a continuum should be because they refuse the use of any kind of aversive. But I see, um, I mean, myself, I, I'm light handed. Um, I use aversives kind of like a scalpel to fix things. Right. They're, they're not my major tools. My right. Own. But other trainers, I'm sure, uh, like the e-collar is a major tool. They get started with that as a puppy. And so that type of person would definitely be further down the continuum than I am. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm such a big advocate of, of education. I wouldn't say that I'm advocate of punishment because that, that's ridiculous. But educate and, and you know, like, like things work. And if they work, we need to understand them and we need to get good at them and use them for what we need to use them instead of going through, I don't know, I mean, th think of any behavioral problem that's a little bit more serious and more per more persistent and a force free trainer will go the route of we're going to go some differential reinforcement programming and we're going to take our time and we're going to take two steps towards the whatever it is the the and if it doesn't work we're going to step back and so on and we're going to teach something incompatible and we're going to spend three months or three years and eventually the dog's going to be seven years or eight years and it, it wouldn't matter or the owner's going to be like, I cannot do this. I'm taking that dog to the shelter and all scientific papers. I mean, it's just zillions of papers. It's just, we, we shouldn't even be talking about it, but differential reinforcement combined with punishment, especially if you, especially if you don't know what's reinforcing or you cannot control that reinforcer that creates the bad thing. Punishment does magic at that moment, and then you take it to the differential reinforcement, and now you have a plan. I couldn't agree more. As a, my business as a canine consultant, much of the time is teaching people how to appropriately use punishment, how to use it in a humane and appropriate way to get the effectiveness that you're talking about. It works. The reason I was bringing this up is because I, I talk about it so much, so much, and sometimes I feel that I shouldn't because it's really, I mean, it's everything is of interest as a dog trainer to me, but sometimes on, on social media, I would defend the use of electric colors. Guess what happens? The, the worst crowd is trying to team up with me. I'm like, dude, we are not the same. Just because you and I hold remote collar, we are not the same. Like I cannot, like, please don't tag me in your posts. And, and just like you were saying, like, I mean, it is a little puppy. Why do we need to do this? It's not a, if you, if you're so big on electricity, just get to magnets and use the plus and minus and play with them, you know? You don't need a live puppy to do that with. Of course, if the puppy, I don't know, it, it I had a, I mean, I mean, just, just recently here, I sold the puppy to somebody and they had to go to Arizona and the puppy is eight weeks old but they had to go visit some family in Arizona. And you know how Arizona has the landscaping, it's all gravel and rocks and whatever. So the puppy's never seen it and decides that rocks are cool. So it starts swallowing rocks. So I get a phone call. I'm like, well, don't let him. He's like, no, you don't understand. Like when I touch his stomach, they're jiggling in his stomach. That's how many rocks he's ate. I'm like, e oh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I'm like, okay, let's take him to the vet. Let's hope that maybe he can poop something out and they don't need to open him at eight weeks old. And whatever it is, call me after you get there. I'm going to have to get back and let's see what we do. Luckily, the, the puppy pooped everything out. I mean, they did x-ray a few times and, and it got cleared and whatever. 
And I'm like, well, there's few options. You either have to keep it away because that's all it takes a little puppy. He'll forget like three days, keep him away from the rocks and he'll probably forget about it. But if you cannot, then the other option, let's just suppress it right away. Boom. To where it's worth it, to where it's like, no, don't question. Rocks are a bad idea. It's an easy concept. In, in situation like this, yeah, sure, I would do it. But to go nick and nick and working level and like just this uh, constant electric stimulation on a, on a, forget a puppy, any dog. I see it as a lack of understanding. They think... I, I, I have a feeling that a lot of the, especially the young trainers, it's not so much about accomplishing something with the dog and put, keeping the dog in the right mind, but proving to themselves how good of a trainer they are. To where the, the actual being, that little dog, it's not the important part the important part is how good of a trainer i am look what i can do this is uh um i don't know what you see around in your in your experience but i i this is like my observation lately i think that's more common in competition less common in pet homes but sure but the professional trainers that work with pet owners do the same thing a, a lot of them at least i mean you have the divides of course right but um it's like oh no we the first thing is we we're not gonna actually make that dog like us we're gonna start zapping him like a using him like a remote control car like okay go away come back go away come back do this don't do this it's like hey that thing has a little somebody there acknowledge him give him some love at least at least take your time like yes you can teach a dog to heal and sit and down in two weeks and then the next trainer is oh i can do it in one week he's like what are we racing for? Just to, to burn the fuses of the animals? I, I want to hear some of your, when you did all the laboratory stuff, any, anything that would stick out right away in your mind, any, any kind of story. I really want to, any, any of those, of any of your research, or any, anything that you played in the laboratory environment that was that you got surprised the study involved excessive drinking behavior it was related to some of the research um john Stadden had done and i was brand new grad student it was early research and you know i, I the animal supposed to the rat is supposed to drink too much like a normal rat might drink 10 milliliters an adult male, a large rat, might drink 15 milliliters. We're talking water or alcohol this. or... Okay, okay. Water, water. Actually, it'll even work with alcohol, and I did studies mm -hmm, like that mm -hmm. as well. 5% alcohol, a way to get the animal drunk. As a result of the training, over days, they begin to drink excessively. And within four days, the animal drank like 40, 50 milliliters. And I didn't believe it. I thought that I made a mistake. So the next day I camped out and watched the rat in the cage. And sure enough, it was drinking like a maniac and then it was urinating. And then I realized that, no, I didn't make a mistake. Uh, it really was drinking too much. I always thought that was kind of funny because it was just like, wow, stuff really happened. So, so what did you make of that? Well, it was this complex stuff of, of why does it drink too much? It, it's some complex phenomena. It was called schedule-induced polydipsia. Uh, dipsy is drinking, poly is too much. Uh, schedule, schedules reinforcement. So basically what we did is, it was originally a study by Skinner and uh, Stadden proved Skinner wrong in this case. Uh, it was called superstition in the pigeon. And basically what 
Yes, I, I struggled with that one. I man, I've read that one so many times. With some thick stuff, but that was a study where Skinner gave the pigeon some grain, some food every 15 seconds. And the pigeon started doing, he did this with a bunch of pigeons and they all started doing goofy behaviors in between the food deliveries. And Skinner said it was the accident that the food rewarded the behavior. Right. And so whatever the rat, the rat was doing just prior to food delivery, that got rewarded. Well, Stadden and a colleague, Simmelhag, Stadden and Simmelhag showed that that was all wrong. That uh, biology plays a big role. And if you take a thirst, uh, a hungry rat, and you give it food regularly, uh, you can generate this excessive drinking. Uh, if I put a, a wood chunk in the cage, I could generate the chewing at the wood. Uh, they call it pica. Uh, okay. If I put a wheel in the cage, I could generate wheel running. But the, the thing that Stadden and Simmelhag showed was that those weird behaviors, they don't happen just before the food, as Skinner predicted. But Skinner never looked at the rat in the cage. Stan and Simmelhag did. And when you look at them, you see that these behaviors, they're not related to the food. They're generated by the schedule due to the animal's biology, keeping things simple. Uh, but it wasn't, it was a mistake by Skinner. It yeah. was an interesting he, mistake. Man, he has few mistakes, but he saw, so, so. Anybody that, that's pro, that is that productive and prolific yes, is going to make course. some mistakes. Yes. But Skinner, as, as uh, Dr. Stadden indicated, was a most interesting individual, a brilliant man. Have you, did you have a chance to, to meet in person or no, Skinner? Uh, Skinner. Skinner, I once attended a seminar he gave, but that mm. was along with 3,000 other people. <laughs> Sure. Well, it's still something. And it was a couple of years just before he died, so I never uh, spoke with or met Skinner. I did uh, meet some of his students and stuff like that, but not Skinner himself. Awesome. Man, thank you for this. We, we got to meet in person sometime soon. It's been a very long time. But you do travel. Hey, you pass through my neck of the woods. We get together. What I'm doing now, I'm, I'm, I just bought this... Uh, sprinter van and i'm converting it and i'm gonna load up some dogs and i'm definitely coming your way go near chicago i connect with you yeah. i'm not that far from chicago four hours definitely doing it thank you for joining me and of course you know when i when i get some study that i'm gonna get stuck and hit a wall i'm calling you thanks mark have a good night we'll Bye. talk soon thank you